Well, uh, I'd like to welcome our panel of astronauts and cosmonauts. By the way, we've got a cosmonaut here. <laughs> and um, one of the things that people have asked is, why are so many astronauts and cosmonauts uh, involved in this asteroid thing? And so I thought we would uh, address that ourselves as to what it is that we, that we love about asteroids or what is it uh, uh, that, that leads us to this, uh, to this field. And I thought I'd, I'd give a little bit of background about how the astronauts uh, and cosmonauts got involved formally in, in this. Shortly after we started working on the asteroid issue, um, we realized that uh, when you start to deflect an asteroid, if one is headed for the Earth, that in that process of deflecting an asteroid away from the Earth, you actually move the impact point across the Earth until it's off the Earth. And in moving that impact point across the Earth one way or the other, you take it across many other countries in that process. And so we realized that deflection itself, which would really eliminate the risk to everybody, would temporarily put at risk other people around the world. And that introduced a new non-technical issue, which was the geopolitical question of, is that okay? I mean, dragging an impact point across somebody's country, do you need their permission? You know, how do they, if they're running for prime minister at the moment, you know, do they say yes or no? Or, you know, so it got to be very complicated. And the question came up, how do we get confront world leaders with this issue because they're going to get involved in it. So when the decision comes to act and what to do, the, the geopolitical community is going to get in there. And so in looking at the question of how to bring this to world leaders, I realized at one point that our Association of Space Explorers, our professional organization of astronauts and cosmonauts, the ASE that we're all members of, was the ideal organization to raise this issue and probably in the United Nations. And so in 2005 at our annual Congress, that was that year in Salt Lake City, I proposed that and all of you guys voted for uh, forming the Association of Space Explorers Committee on Near Earth Objects. And so that's how astronauts and cosmonauts got involved. But of course, each of us has flown in space and we all have individual reasons for you know, relating to astronaut, uh, asteroids, excuse me, keep mixing up astronauts and asteroids. Um, Nicole, I know you had a an ex particular personal experience looking down at the Earth one night. What, tell us about that. Yeah, I th you know, there are a lot of surprising things about looking down at the Earth from space. And I think perspective is one of those words that comes to mind when we think about our spaceflight experience. And uh, for me, I, I remember looking out the window one night and seeing this shooting star below me. And that was so different. I mean, my brain almost couldn't wrap around it because we get so used to, I think, you know, terrestrially, we look up at the sky, we look at the wonders of the sky, and we, we hope for shooting stars, you know, the, to make our wish and those kinds of things. And to see it from space was a, a really unique thing. And, you know, there was certainly the, the beauty aspect of it. Wow, that's really, really beautiful. But then there was also the, wow, holy moly, I'm really thankful that I'm seeing that because that means it's not hit, hitting my spaceship, <laughs> you know. And, and, and like everything in space and what we're doing on the space station right now, which is this international cooperation, this beautiful, um, unifying uh, global thing where we've brought together these countries. We're doing very complex things in space, both the science and just having the station up there. And that we've done that so peacefully and successfully. When I look at what we're thinking about now with respect to asteroids and how that is a global thing to be, to be concerned with. And as a community, we can certainly have a voice in helping bring that unity together, bring that, that global cooperation that will need to happen, like you said, Rusty, when we come to the point of having to deal with it. Well, that's a, actually, that's a great introduction for uh, Jean-Francois, because uh, Jean-Francois, I know in particular, sees astro asteroids as an opportunity to bring the world together. Yes, I, I had the same experience, and the first time we saw, uh, as a crew on my first flight, a shooting star from above, we didn't think it was a shooting star. We just wondered, what is this? Yeah. Because uh, naturally, we think shooting stars are above us. 
But you know, when you look at the Earth from space, you see that it is limited, like our own spaceship. In resources, it houses life, like our spaceship. And uh, we like to compare Earth as a spaceship. And asteroids is one more contribution to that comparison, because the threats that asteroids, uh, asteroid poses to Earth are comparable to the threats that what we call micrometeorites that are more numerous and can impact our own spaceship. We have to protect for long duration mission, for example, we have shield uh, around the habitats of the space station. So, you know, astronauts are problem solvers. They like problems because they like to find solutions. And uh, Earth is a spaceship. We are all crew members on Earth of that spaceship, not passengers passive waiting for people taking care of us. We have all our own responsibility. And uh, so if you think uh, Earth as a spaceship with this threat of asteroids, which are more an opportunity because we will become smarter because of this problem, you compare with our own spaceship with one difference. In space, we can deviate our own spaceship to avoid uh, micrometeorites or rocks. And we do it uh, regularly. Yeah. But we cannot deviate Earth, so we have to learn to deviate asteroids. And some astronauts like Ed are, and some of you are very smart to, to know how to do that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit too. I wanted to ask Doran though. Doran spent uh, many, many years in implementing a lot of what we've just been talking about. That is trying to unify the world around uh, any number of problems, but uh, especially in the Outer Space Committee of the United Nations. So Doran, what, why did you get interested in, in asteroids out of that experience? Rusty, actually, I, during the years, I had different positions, from the executive positions, diplomatic positions. I work within many international institutions. And I discovered that some of these institutions deal with the same problem from different point of view, but they did not know about each other. So I like very much to put them together, to put the people to work together, to discover that the problems are common for all of us, but just have to be solved together. And this is an intriguing problem for me, and I really like to, to, to push the things on this way. Besides that, uh, I like asteroids because just one of the asteroids wears my name. It's the asteroid <laughs> right. 10,707 Prunario. Uh, I, I, I was informed about these things this spring, and uh, I'm very happy that uh, after all this work i have done till now, uh, some international organizations just recognize it by naming an asteroid with my name. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I think a number of us have, have asteroids named <laughs> after us, but that, that, that's part of the fun. Um, Ed, I know you have a, a sort of longer range view about uh, the asteroid challenge actually being an opportunity for humanity today. T tell, tell us why that is what you yeah, think. Yeah, I, I think this is our chance to do something big. I mean, if, you, if you'd really like, this is, this is a, um, you know, a grand challenge for humanity. Um, if you look at our, the history of our planet, four and a half billion years, this, the third planet from the sun has been struck by asteroids, large and small, um, thousands of times. And if you look at what we have the opportunity to do, it is to change the evolution of the entire solar system such that the third planet no longer gets hit by large asteroids. And you, that's actually within our capability. That allows us to use the science and the technology and the astronomy and the engineering that we've developed over the last several thousand years and to make it actually work. I mean, I, I think back to uh, Jean-Francois here and I got to fly on, on my very first flight, his second flight, uh, 20 years ago. And on the last day before we landed, we were uh, overlooking the Earth, and Jean-Francois, who's the philosopher astronaut, I like to call him, <laughs> he said, you know, you know, when you look out at how big the, the Earth and the universe looks, you know, it makes us feel very small. He goes, but at the same time, you think about, we're all sitting here in an orbiting spaceship built by human beings, traveling uh, nearly 18,000 miles an hour. And I said, but it makes us feel like we can do anything. And you know, both, both of those things are true. And I, and I think it's rather amazing that we tiny little human beings on this rock orbiting the sun, crew members, as you say, Jean-Francois, are able to change the evolution and protect our planet. And I think that's absolutely way, amazing. What we're talking about is actually being able to very slightly change the structure of the solar system to enhance evolution of life here on Earth, to keep us going. So I found that very interesting. One, one thing I, I've often thought about um, that also contributes at least to our ability to deal with the asteroid issue as astronauts and cosmonauts 
is our familiarity with rendezvous in space. I mean, we, you know, a deflection of an asteroid is often involves a rendezvous where you don't stop, you know, where you just keep going and, and hit it. But we're accustomed to navigating in space and maneuvering in space, different orbits, different changes of, of velocity. So it seems to me that that's another reason why there's a kind of natural relationship between astronauts and cosmonauts and, and, uh, and the asteroid challenge. So what, where do you see us going from here, Nicole? You're, you're, you're relatively new to the asteroid business. I am business. relatively new to the yeah. asteroid business. Well, I think that it's really encouraging that we're in a forum like this today. You know, it says a lot. We, we're not just in this room here in Luxembourg, but around the world, people are engaging with this activity today. Uh, there's an awareness that's coming from it that I really w do believe will drive action, will drive action yeah. that um, is maybe, you know, homegrown in some ways, just to be, you know, more familiar with what's going on, but also at the extremes where we really can take advantage of the technology that we have and that we're developing to put that protection around our planet. You know, one of the things uh, I've thought about, and Doran and I, of course, have done a lot of this work in the United Nations, and one of the things that I realized, when you think about an actual threat, and especially if it's Tunguska size or larger, where you're talking about potentially a lot of people being damaged, uh, you realize that the world is suddenly gonna take a brand new thing, a brand new hazard, very seriously, very fast, overnight, as it were. And, uh, you know, the, the, the decision, because many nations will be involved and put at risk, potentially, the decision whether to deflect, how to deflect, all of those things are going to be made not by any one nation, but by the planet. This is literally going to be a planetary project when we get a threat from an asteroid. And first to detect, because... Uh, there are many, many asteroids we, we don't know, we haven't seen yet, but so we, most? Uh, most of them. Most of them. I, I like this uh, American writer who wrote, the dinosaurs disappeared because they didn't have a space program. <laughs> we have a space yeah. program, we have smart people who can uh, learn how to, I mean, who can find how, how, how to detect all those we cannot see today and eventually to deflect the ones that are dangerous to us. So it's, uh, it's an opportunity to become smarter and, and like I said, change the destiny of our solar system, including humankind. Jean-Francois, I think we not only have to become smarter, but wiser. Yes. <laughs> because that, it, there's going to be a lot of wisdom required when it comes to trading <coughs> off, let's say, national interests. I don't, I don't want the impact point to be dragged across my country, <laughs> but if that's the only way that everybody can be put you know, completely at ease by eliminating the risk to everybody to have it come across my country. I've got a responsibility to to say yes on, on, on that. But that's pretty tough, you know. Do you deviate to the east, to the west, to the north, to the south? <laughs> well, not, not the uh, just says, east or west. You have to go. There's, there's a line that we have to go along. Right? <laughs> but the decision is, you know, do you take it across your country or my country? And that decision will be in the process. And uh, that's going to be a tough one for, for people to make. You know, you, the people maybe ask why we astronauts and uh, more than other people, we, we feel this responsibility. We just have seen the planet from, from outside and right. we've seen that this is the only home of us, all of us. And we really feel the responsibility to protect it, to inform people, to let them know more than they know now. And uh, as long as uh, the general population listen to the astronauts much more than to the other people and we have an impact, we really like to act together, to work together and to promote the knowledge about the asteroids. I think that perhaps in addition to having a shared experience, all of us, of seeing the whole planet every hour and a half you go around it again and again, uh, in addition, or along with that wonderful experience we've all had, comes a sense of responsibility. And to some extent, I, I, I'm, I'm sure for, for most of us, that's one of the reasons why this is an opportunity to use space technology to ultimately help sustain life on, on the planet. Rusty, you were part of this, uh, the Apollo program, and you know, 
Um, you know, I remember it as a, a child watching it, but I, I, and, and I've seen videos of the world stopping on July 20th, 1969, as everyone watched, you know, in Times Square and in other locations, um, the successful landing on the moon. And I can tell you that someday, you know, it may be 10 years from now, maybe 100 years from now, who knows when it is, when we do face a deflection threat and we do deflect an asteroid successfully, it'll be that times 10 because everyone will be watching. Mm -hmm. They will be looking to see that this has been successful. And that will be a unifying moment, I think, in human history. And you know, we mentioned also we've seen shooting stars from above, but we've seen craters Yes. from past impact that are big. <laughs> so we, we were happy to not be yes. living at the time those impacts uh, took place. Oh, but uh, Jean-Francois, you haven't seen anything. I mean, if you go out around the moon, the way my, <laughs> the way my <laughs> Apollo friends did, <laughs> you know, you see so many craters, you, you can't deal with it. Yeah, I mean, we have craters on beautiful. craters, right? <laughs> and in fact, I think it is something which many people really don't realize that uh, they don't see many craters on the Earth. And why are we so concerned about this? And really, you have to look at the moon to realize that all of those craters would be on the Earth as well if we didn't have an atmosphere that protected us from the small ones and wind and rain and tornadoes and volcanoes and things that, that erase the, the trace of those uh, asteroid impacts. But if you look at the moon, that's reality in terms of the shooting gallery that we run around the sun with. In. Yeah, I would like to add, I had a chance to, to look at the sky by night with night vision glasses, I mean Googles. I could see shooting stars continuously, many every seconds. Yeah. So if we do this, we realize how much matter comes from space every second, every minute. Uh, I don't know how many. A hundred tons every night tons. comes into the Earth's Fortunately, they are small enough, but one day. Yeah, and it's maybe. only a matter of, of uh, when, not if. Yeah, there's a, f a phrase that, uh, um, that uh, you can't beat the house. It's a, it's a phrase from gambling, at the, you know, and uh, you know, this is a bit like Las Vegas in some sense. Most days we're lucky, he goes, but you can't, you can't win forever, right? You know, and, and the key is that we're not the house. <laughs> yeah. Just one thing, you said that we see all these uh, shooting stars during the night. They are also during the day, but we don't see them. So half of the Earth could be hidden any time, and we don't know when and how. We can't discover the asteroids that come to us during the daytime. So this is also an important problem. So the rate of discovery should increase very much, and yeah. uh, the asteroid day uh, movement, they ask for uh, asteroid uh, day declaration to increase 100 times the rate of discovery with the help of anyone on the Earth, with the general population, with uh, the astro clubs, uh, with the big uh, uh, telescopes in the world, B612. with the help of telescopes on the orbit, with any, any other means that right. could discover asteroids. And to know much more about them. We just learn a lot of things now about asteroids. Yeah, you know, the, uh, this is a good way, I think, to close our panel. We do have to turn it over to other people. But when we started Asteroid Day, uh, one of the things many of us were concerned about and realized that the public could really help us with yeah. was to encourage the space agencies of the world to increase the rate of discovery. And so we came up, as you said, Doreen, with the 100X declaration and uh, I'd like to say that uh, people who are watching Asteroid Day uh, today uh, can go to the asteroidday.org website and sign the 100X declaration. We have tens of thousands of people who have already signed it, and we really need millions of people uh, to be, uh, have their signatures on the 100X declaration so that we can perhaps in the next uh, 15 or 20 years have a full inventory of all of the asteroids out there that have a potential to harm life here on Earth. Well, with that, uh, I want to thank all the panelists for joining in here and turn it back over to Sabini. Thank you very much, Rusty, and thank you also to the knowledgeable panel who I hopefully made us not only smarter, but a bit wiser. 
And I think it's time to go over to London and UK. And don't forget that London is one of the um, is where Astro Day was co-founded. And I hope I have Debbie Lewis with us. She's the deputy chair of Astro Day's expert panel and a specialist in risk, crisis, and disaster management. Debbie, lovely to have you with us. Thank you. How's everything going in the UK? What are you up to? Well, we're at the Imperial College in London, and uh, we've got some fantastic speakers uh, that have joined us today. And we were very lucky to have the astronaut, the female astronaut, uh, Dr. Helen Sharman, and she opened the event for us this morning. And it was an absolute delight and a pleasure to meet her. Um, and of course, as a risk, crisis, and disaster management um, uh, uh, consultant uh, on this special on this subject, then uh, it's been really important, to obviously, to uh, to engage. Uh, and to coordinate with the scientific community, uh, and many of whom are with me today. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a great day that we're having here in London. And how is Astro Day, because it's now the third um, in, in row, how is it being perceived now that it's, I mean, it's grown twice its size, and I'm sure that London is one of the contributors? Um, it is one of the contributors. Uh, I'll be honest with you, um, we could always do more. Um, and certainly I'm a, I'm a great advocate for, for wanting people to be more engaged and more involved. Um, but I think it, it's the start of a discussion, it's the start of a process to raise the awareness of the hazard caused by, uh, caused by asteroids. Um, and just to be able to do basic um, uh, just provide to be able to, to be able to provide basic information such as uh, warning, informing, and advising, um, is, is is a good start. Um, but I, I think we're on a we're on a journey to raise awareness, um, and I certainly think that we've we've started we've started the process, um, and we've based a, we have a good platform to base um, to which we can move on from, and we can continue to sort of gather momentum and garner more engagement and more support. Well, thank you, Debbie, and thank you, Astro Day in London, for your support. And with that, I'd like to head on to Astro Day in India. And Mila Mitra, are you with us? Yeah, I am with you. OK, we were just in London. Now we're in India. It goes quickly, even on Earth. So how is everything going on your end? It's great. And uh, good afternoon and happy Asteroid Day to all of you. And uh, this is Meena Mitra again with Space India, who are the regional coordinators of Asteroid Day India. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's going great this year. The momentum has built up a lot and exciting events are occurring around the country. Just highlighting a few of them. Uh, Space India with Nehru Planetarium Delhi today conducted an event where we plotted asteroid pictures discovered by students as part of All India Asteroid Search Campaign on the Dome. Dr. Patrick Michael also Skyped in and joined us. Nehru Planetarium Mumbai and Nehru Planetarium Bangalore are also conducting displays of meteorites and hosting lectures. Ujjain Planetarium and SOS Bhuvaneshwar will conduct asteroid quizzes. The Astronomy Society of India, POEC, have also initiated many activities. And I would like to say the enthusiasm has been building up, and many of our schools and the public, we are doing many events today to bring public awareness of Asteroid Day to the public and to schools. And uh, thank you, Asteroid Day team, for bringing this movement to all. Thank you so much, Mila, and happy Asteroid Day also to everyone in India. And thank you for your generous support in raising awareness and educating also the children of your country. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Stuart, who's now going to have a one-on-one -on -one interview. Thank you, Sabinia. Yes, I'm here with Dorin Prunariu, who is Romania's first and so far only astronaut, but in a larger sense is engaged in the whole world in talking about asteroids and the need for humanity to engage in their study. Dorin, thank you again for coming along today. Welcome. Tell me why it's so important that we engage in the study of asteroids as a global endeavour. Actually, the asteroids, when they hit, if they hit the Earth, they cause global problems. So the problem of the asteroids is by itself a global problem. Even if an asteroid hits in one part of another part of the world, like in 2013, the Chelyabinsk asteroid, it hit it 
and destroyed uh, all windows of the city and wounded about 1,300 people. And it had only 17 meters in diameter. If a bigger asteroid comes, we all have to be aware what it means, what we have to do, and how to act at a global level. So this is the reason that I promoted the Asteroid Day and the problem of the asteroids at the level of the United Nations. We already had, within the UN Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space, a working group on near-Earth objects. But the contribution of the astronauts, of the astronauts and of our group of people to the UN work was tremendous because we instantly uh, grew the interest for this problem all over the world. And our studies were very beneficial to the studies already made by the UN. And in this context, uh, the UN approved the organization of two big international advisory institutions, one dealing with the discovery of the asteroids, the calculation of the orbits, and the aware of, uh, awareness of the all institutions about the danger they pose, and the other one gathering the space agencies of the world to make possible the deflection of the asteroids, to put together the means, the technologies, to launch rockets, to see what we can do and how we can do to protect our Earth. And this is very important for me, for all of us, and for the international institutions. Also. Yes, thank you, Dorian. Welcome. So now we're going to take uh, a short break from the live presentation here. We've got some videos to watch, but join us again in 10 minutes where the live coverage of Asteroid Day 2017 will continue here in Luxembourg.